Guten Tag. Guten Tag. Okay, I'm here with Yellow Pete, uh, member of Evil Geniuses, obviously, plays the AD carry position. Now, obviously, when I usually start these interviews, I tend to just go like to a, a, a far back point in someone's career, and then we kind of go chronologically forwards. But since I've interviewed every other member of your team now, we've already talked a million times about <laughs> certain matches over and over. So instead, where I just wanted to start with you, actually, was before CLG. So when you were in this team, like GG, okay, you with Freddy122, with... Snoopy with Yellow um, Crepo. Uh, I did this interview with Freddy122 where he said, like I asked him, so when you were in this team with, you know, Yellow Pete, these guys who are now in CLG and EG, like, you know, you must have thought they were going to become pros and they were going to be really good or something. And he was like, no, nah, I thought they'd never make it actually. They were like so passive, you know, like that wasn't the style of play. I mean, was this really the case? Like you weren't like destined to become good players? Um, I definitely understand this notion there. Like back then, we actually tended to play a little bit differently still, and we weren't really like we were good players, but not like super great. And um, I think what like just the the fact that we stick together so long as a team was kind of what made us really good. Like we were we had some upset at the start with uh, Kings of Europe, which was already like we were regarded as a pretty good team there. But we really grew over time. I think with OGN that was was made us what made us really strong because the the interesting thing is obviously to the most casual fan they think of like CLG EU and they just think oh every game they just went made it last as long as possible they were super passive they never attacked or anything and yet when you actually look at your team like wicked was known for being a very aggressive player uh, some of the other players sometimes have been described as aggressive in their career so was it actually like a conscious decision when you made the team like we're going to have more of a passive style like is it you and someone else who's decided like this is more influencing the style? Like how did it, how did it come around if not all the players are just passive, you know? Honestly, we didn't sit together and told, told ourselves like, okay, we're going to play this way. We're going to stall out every game until it was like 50 minutes and then we would win with the superior team comp. It was just the, the way it really went naturally because we often, even in OGN where we made it pretty far, we got second, uh, we often tended to have a very, very bad early game and um, we would just naturally lose out from that. And then, you know, what can you really do to back, get back into the game? You have to turtle, basically, and that's what, what it ended up being for us. So it's not, not really that much of a conscious decision. decision. Although our, all our mindsets kind of play into it, we were all like kind of, um, had kind of a safe mindset, you know, you just taking small advantages, not big ones, and taking small risks as well. I mean, you mentioned there, like, as a general approach, obviously, if you have this mentality of, like, let's just take the small gains over the game, that will sort of lead to sort of a, a more of this stall-out style. Uh, when people look back now, when their team had a lot of success with that style, they're going to think, oh, no, it was all premeditated. They thought, like, this is the ideal stuff. We've mapped it out. You know, this is how you beat Moscow Fire. This is how you do all the rest. But since your team didn't do so well when it switched over to Season 3, then people are going to think, oh, okay, so it must have been like something in the Season 3 changes that just messed up the whole style. So that's, what, that's how people will, will think of things when they're not like a top-level player, you know. And so instead, I noticed something interesting you said in an interview where you actually said that you thought the reason why that style didn't work anymore was more that the other teams in Europe, etc., who you'd play, sort of figured out the counters to it or what to do to mess it up early on so it wouldn't work, you know. Uh, how much of it was that style not being viable was actually like season three changes, like specific things to champions or the roles and how much was like the other teams kind of like finally figuring out, okay, this is what we do to account, make that not work. I think the only thing that really is, was kind of a nerf to our play style overall in season three was that the support junglers weren't as strong anymore since we tended to play those basically in all our games. Um, and it was all about like bruiser and carry junglers. And that's, but I think that's actually the only change that really affected it a lot. And the rest is just teams getting better, honestly, around us while we're, we're just a bit stagnating and not really innovating a lot, just like playing our game. And yeah, that's where it ended up then. Is there anything specific that like teams in general do that makes that old style not work? Like is it split pushing? What, what is it that's kind of like messing it up so you can't go with the old style? Um, they Generally, they got better understanding of like, mid and late game team fights and how to really close out a game. If people don't know how to properly close out a game, it's pretty easy to turtle against them and just get into late game. But if they know, like if they have the guts to actually tower dive and like do risky plays that will just finish the game really quick once they have an advantage, then that's hard to pull off. That's interesting because I actually have seen players say that 
and uh, even people on Reddit, etc. that when you look at, like, LCS was a good example, because originally everyone thought, okay, we have these top four teams, then we have these four teams that no one's really sure how good they'll be. And I noticed in both NA and the EU LCS, those teams, they could have, like, a good early game. Maybe they could get a little bit of an advantage. But when they had, like, just a small advantage where they couldn't just end the game immediately, they had they tended to sort of, like, they were hesitant, like, do we attack now and end the game, or do we wait a bit, and then suddenly our advantage is gone, and it's like, oh, what do we do now? Is there something... Uh, specific about why the certain teams like have that understanding is it just experience like how like what do you have to develop in a team to be able to like effectively just close the game at the right time you know like the timing of it the best way to do it is to just know how strong every of your champions is at every point and what they can do and then maximize basically what you take out of that potential if you know you have like a strong assassin at one point and like you you would have to exploit that if you don't exploit it then this advantage will like uh, gradually fade the uh, longer the game goes like uh, uh, a certain advantage gold advantage or something is just not worth as much as it is in uh, like 10 minutes ago so it's yeah it's just it's really it is a lot of experience just knowing what can be done and then just having the courage basically to also execute it even if it's sort of risky play because this is something I noticed that in League of Legends, I think has taken more, longer for teams to develop an understanding of. Because I used to follow a competitive brood war in South Korea, where it was like very, very high level play. And in that, everything had sort of been mapped out to a degree. So people had a sense of these timing windows that you had in the game. So, okay, if, I, if I've like played a certain build versus your build, then when I have this unit at this minute of the game, I might have like a one minute window where I can do a lot of damage with it. But if I just mess around and I don't attack you with it, and I don't put pressure on, then after the, the minute, it might actually be completely reversed. Now I might be in a complete disadvantage because I needed to sort of get ahead for when you get something else later. And so this is kind of the similar scenario we're talking about here where you have a window where your advantage actually exists. And so if you kind of mess that around, then you might think in your own head, we still have that advantage from earlier, but really it might not even count anymore. And I think you see it in League of Legends when games go to the really late game and teams have been thinking like, well, we've been winning the small fights over and over, but then the other team has like just all tanks or something like something ridiculous that's going to be difficult. Um, do you think it's the case that like, uh, like has your team always understood this style? Like did the Koreans understand it ages back when you were there? Like were they, were they ahead of the game in this sense? I don't believe so, no. I don't think the Koreans were, like when we were still there, they definitely weren't ahead of the rest of the world. Okay. Uh, I think right now they might be. And the the thing is, you compared it to Brood War, for example, I don't really know that game too much, but I reckon that the um, League of Legends might be a little bit, since it comes down to team fights a lot, it might be a little bit more complex in the in the amount of setups there can be for like champions, builds, and the respective approach you you have to take to win the game, sort of. So it's not like a a really simple equation most of the time. It's just more like of a of a feeling and having intuition what your team comp can do at any given point. Okay, that's something else I wanted to ask about though, because not to give another StarCraft example, I've seen a lot of StarCraft players where to a fan, they look at, they break down what the player did, okay, so they look at the winning player and they think, oh, he must have just known at all times, like, this is exactly what I'm going to do here, and then this will be the right counter to what he does there, and they think it's all, it's all planned out, he's just a genius, you know, and then the guy who lost, they think, oh, he, he had the wrong strategy the whole time, but I've seen in interviews of players who are very, very good, that sometimes in the actual game, they're not really making conscious decisions, like, they're not, they don't have time to stop and think, okay, well, let me assess the situation, what am I going to do here, it's kind of like, like, in the midst of the game, you have to kind of just intuitively react you know and that's what you're training in practice is like how do I what decision making do I make naturally while I'm in the game and so the, the question coming from this basically is like when you're in these big games that are going to late game or like there's a huge team fights with all these variables to calculate and no one probably in the game knows every single thing that's going to happen etc like how much of it is just like reactive play and how much can you really prepare and have this set up planned okay so when we get to this point you'll do this now that like how much can you really balance out the two like strategic plan play and like reactive play. Mm. It's more like a conceptual thing that you can't prepare for a team fight. Say you, uh, I don't know, you want to rather peel for this or that carry or you rather want to assassinate this or that champion, but overall you, you cannot 100% predict how it's going to go, obviously, and there's always the variable of personal, like the, the actual play that the player has to do, the mechanical play, which he might mess up or might execute really well. So you definitely can't really make the game plan up and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the time to either, as you said. So it really comes down to game sense, and game sense is just something you develop over playing 
an insane amount of games and which allows you to make these decisions very quickly on the fly and ha like have a pretty good accuracy in uh, in your you know, in choosing a successful um, strategy. I, I have a hit theory I want to run by you that I heard from somewhere. It sounded interesting, okay? So when they were trying to look at the different regions in League of Legends at the moment and try and figure out like what is the difference between them in terms of skill or whatever, instead of just putting it down to like mechanical skill or something like that, someone said that they, their observation was that when they watched, for example, like some of the lower teams in uh, the LCS NA, they would see that like, okay, so in team fights, a lot of them tended to just kind of be playing almost for themselves. Like they do something over here and then it, it, their teammate does something over there. And if it works out, then oh great, it looks really good, bro. Otherwise, they might just completely fall apart. Whereas, like, some of the best European teams, okay, they have, like, a level of coordination when they go into the team fight. They have an idea in advance where they're going to position each other. But then someone else, this is the person's theory still, they then said that that only kind of lasted for the beginning of the team fight. Then it would get quite chaotic, and then the players, again, would be just sort of playing reactively, or they just focus on their own game, essentially tunneling in. Whereas they told me they thought the reason why some of the best Asian teams, so, like, even, like, TPA or Frost, these sorts of teams, World Elite, why they thought they were better was because when it got to like really big team fights, they said that they could keep, it looked like they could keep their level of coordination like more throughout the fight. So that not just the beginning, but like as the fight went on and on and on, they could just like still be working as a unit. Is there anything to this theory? Is it just off the wall? What do you think? Um, it's, uh, it's a bit of, I don't know, like I wouldn't really put it like that. It's, it's really keeping up the coordination during a team fight. It's just a matter of like, multitasking really well, you obviously have to keep track of your own champion, of all the champions around you, like make decisions for your own, but also like take the input of of your shot call or something. So that's just I mean, they might they might be able to keep up that level of coordination longer throughout the team fight, but it's not I wouldn't say that was like the characterizing uh, difference between Korean or European or NA teams. Because when I have done interviews with other members of your team, they all stress this point that they don't think that it's, for your team at least, they don't think it's ideal to have the one shot caller guy who just makes every decision. And, you know, even if other people have a good idea, they have to sort of like say something to him and then he decides whether you do it or not. Because they were emphasizing the point, which is correct, that I, in an ideal world, okay, if you could have like computers play the game who were perfect at the game, then it would actually be ideal to have all five players be able to make the perfect decision for themselves that would work within the concept of the team because then you don't have the lag of like saying something to this guy, he decides, then he comes back because those seconds could cost you like a, a chance or something, you know. And so the reason why I want to ask you about this though is because we see some of the Asian teams at least use that method of having like the one guy who's just like, he's the genius and we let him make all the decisions for us, you know. Uh, is that like overplayed? Do you think that some of those teams are more democratic in how they do it? Because... They certainly seem to be doing better overall, but your team, obviously, like I said, in an ideal world, maybe that would be the best system, but it also seems like it's also quite a dangerous system because then if any member of the team's a bit off in his calls or whatever, then people are like, there's two counter calls going on and someone else is like, ah, I don't know if we should do either. Like, how do, how do you balance it out like that? What do you think? Um, yeah, that's definitely a good point you brought up there. Like the, um, I think the majority of teams, even like in NA and EU and Korea have one or maybe two shot calls, uh, especially during team fights. I don't think there's a lot of communication going on from the other team members. Um, and in clutch situations, honestly, I think it's often better just because of the having, the one guy. having the one guy is often better just because of how time critical it is to make a, just to make a decision. Whereas like in, in a situation where it's maybe a little bit more relaxed, you're having like a standoff or something, um, having multiple people make decisions and have more eyes on the map um, is not a bad thing, I would say. So, but the the thing you brought up with the confusion with multiple calls is actually pretty dangerous and can end up really like disastrous for for us. And it did sometimes during LCS as well. Um, I believe it was the game in Lille against the um, Copenhagen Wolves, for example. Like it's just multiple calls and like not following one of them is a really big huge disadvantage for that kind of strategy but for our team I still think it's just if you have a single shot call or have a single single person that you really want to trust with all your all your calls then they have to have like godlike judgment basically they have to see everything and basically 
have like instant reaction um, and make up a perfect plan uh, or else you could never be on the same level like you could never make the same quality of plans as five people simultaneously could make so and I don't believe we have such a person on our team so I think for us it's strategically better to have multiple shot calls or have everyone give their opinion I mean, that obviously is the criticism to having the one shot caller that he has to then sort of be like able to think for everyone. He, essentially, he has like imperfect information because he's only playing his role, but he has to be able to make decisions for other people who in theory could have more information themselves, you know. So what I wanted to know then in that case, are people overrating some of the Asian people we hear of? I mean, the obvious example is like Reaper because people think that he sort of like just positions his, his team like pawns and they just do everything he says, which I'm not sure is entirely true. But do you think... Are people like overblowing how good that is, or are these are there really some like genius level guys in League of Legends who can do that? I can't really judge it too much. We can't really listen into into other teams' communication and tournaments and whatnot. But I can definitely I imagine, and for some teams that should be the case that um, like outside of laning, obviously, that actually one or maybe a maximum of two guys makes all the decisions and makes all the calls, and. It's, I wouldn't say it's impossible uh, that, that all these calls are being made one per, by one person and they're having quite a lot of success with it. So, um, yeah, there must be some good chat calls out there. <laughs> is it the case that uh, this sort of, like the downside of what we said of your approach is that obviously then if people are uh, making the wrong call to each other on or counter calls, like they might all be good plans, but they're all different, then it's going to cause confusion or then people are going to, which one are we going to follow, you know? The, the, the downside I could see to that is, I wanted to know, did this play into at all, like overall, what you think's been the problem in season three for your team? Because if, in, if we imagine in season two, you were all at the peak of your form, your style was like fit, working the best. So in that case, everyone has a good idea of, okay, what we're probably going to do now and what would be the next move. Everyone's sort of thinking along similar lines, okay? So you're going to have less of those problems naturally. Whereas if it gets to the case where you're going to have to overhaul the whole style of the team, people are having to play different champions they're not even used to, is that like an element of part of the problem of bit like winning these games? Definitely, yeah. Definitely has been part of the problem for us of performing better. Um, is that our, especially our early game and mid game strategies, um, tended up, tended being a lot more complex than in season two, and um, just the understanding of what play should be made at which point um, was more, yeah, was just more difficult for us as a team to. Uh, to handle than this typical season two, we lane until it's not possible anymore, and then we turtle until we have six items strategy. So um, that's relatively easy to execute. Whereas like the season three style of jungle aggression and early pushes um, requires more coordination and yeah, just understanding of of taking your advantages at every given point. The interesting thing about the way the, the spring season, regular season part of it played out for you guys is that because you had so many problems early on, you were under criticism the whole season through, okay? People were saying like, oh, they've fallen off. Like, because SK came over you and people were expecting them to be below, they were like, oh, they're doing so badly, they're underperforming. But the funny thing is, I said to Snoopy at the end of the regular season, like, if you guys do at all well in the playoffs, people will sort of forget that to a degree. Like, if you'd have got to the final, people would be like, oh, who cares about the regular season? You know, it turned out they were really good anyway. Was it really the case that something was changing during the season that you were figuring out that allowed you to do pretty decently in the playoffs? I mean, you, you beat the first round of opponent and then you didn't lose like massively to Fnatic or anything. Like, was it the case that there was sort of like an upswing or had you, had you always been good and there'd been some weird thing affecting you early? What do you think it was? I definitely think we did get a little bit better over the course of the season. Um, I mean, we had our ups and downs and there's always a little bit of randomness to like single game results always. So it's... It's really hard to judge like what is really due to teams being bad or being good or just do like a bad having a bad day or something. Um, I do think though like our performance from the start of the season towards the end of the season has uh, has been better has improved. Um, but yeah, as you said, <laughs> it's basically only the last result that people really talk about and um, like yeah, it's kind of also a little bit the uh, LCS format that makes this easy to do because it doesn't really matter that much whether you're like first or, or uh, sixth. sixth, it doesn't really matter, you can still win and so as, as long as you're not seventh or eighth it doesn't really 
influence your standings in the LCS too much, which is kind of a flaw in my opinion, actually. Well, it's interesting because a strange thing was, like, if we look at the two playoffs, so the NA one and the EU one, the way the EU one played out roughly is roughly how I thought it would play out, actually, which is, in the, okay, in the regular season, some teams would get, like, surprise wins, like Giants might beat Gambit and say, wow, but, but if they'd have made the playoffs, like, they probably would have just gotten stomped, okay? So when we saw the way the actual playoffs played out, in EU, it was almost like the better team won every single time, for it. like, a better team overall pretty much won every single series, it seemed. Like, you guys just edged out Wolves, who had been, like, rising up, but you were still a little bit ahead of them. You lost to Fnatic, who'd been very good. Now, maybe Gambit and Fnatic people could argue whether or not they, who was the better team. But overall, it seemed like, okay, so the playoff format worked out like the, like the better team did win. So it, no matter what happened in the regular season, like best of X still proved who was better. But then over in LCS NA, it was like, it almost did seem like, okay, it's just who was better on like two days, basically. Like suddenly teams who were sixth place were making all the way to the final. So... It's easy if we only looked at the EU one to be like, oh, it turns out you guys, you know, you did figure it out and you were still like the third best team or whatever overall. But if we're being fair and we compare the two scenarios, okay, not many people would have said like GGU was the second best team in all of NA, but they came second. So if we think of your series against Wolves, your series against Fnatic, and then the series against uh, SK, like how, how accurate were those series in terms of showing who was actually the better team overall, do you think? Like were you actually better than Wolves, but worse than Fnatic and better than SK? How would you figure it out? Um, I think in a best of three is always reasonable accuracy, um, and doing that, yeah, it did show. I think it reflected the strength of the teams really, really well in the European playoffs. Um, I can't really talk for the in North American playoffs too much because I haven't seen all the LCS matches. I don't know the, how the teams have performed, but um, like even in best of three format, there's still a little bit of randomness. Like we we were really close to winning against Fnatic as well and it's it's more from like a day-to-day -day basis but um, yeah I, I think generally the the power of the teams has been represented pretty well by the standings in the end. If you ever try and ask a player before they're about to play the like the playoffs or they don't know who which opponent they're going to face, it's like almost impossible to get them to really tell you like who they'd rather face because they always want to say like no, it doesn't matter who we face because because if, if they get the other one, they don't want to have sort of admitted that they didn't want to play the other guy, you know. But since the playoffs is done now, we already know what the results all are. Is it not the case? Like, this is what I thought when I saw the way the playoffs were being set up. Like, when the last day of Super Week came down, okay, we didn't know which side would Gambit and Fnatic be on. I thought to myself, even though Gambit looked like they might be the stronger team, I actually thought it probably would have been better for your team to get Gambit on your side of the bracket so you play them in the semi-finals because even just the, the regular season results, you'd beaten them twice, whereas I think you'd only beaten Fnatic once or something. And so just the regular season suggested you would have been better. Historically, you always matched up well against them. Was out of the two, Gambit and Fnatic, do you think Fnatic was the harder matchup for you in the semis? Um... Intuitively, I would have rather played against Fnatic than against Gambit. Uh, I just feel... Um, we know them a little bit better. We, uh, we practiced against them a lot, we scrimmed against them a lot. And Gambit is just... I don't know, they're, they're somewhat unpredictable in my opinion. They're really good players individually and it's, it's often... I, I can't even I can't even describe it. It's more like an intuition. I would rather in that situation have faced Fnatic. And why was that? <laughs> I don't know, my my brain's playing tricks on me at that one, but I I just subconsciously feel we have a better chance of beating Fnatic. So so well if we think now though, now that you did lose to Fnatic, I mean would would does that mean you also would have lost the Gambit? Like you still do you still think that way? No, like either matchup could have gone either way, and the matchup against Fnatic was really, really close. So it's no, I don't really feel that way. Like oh no, I would rather have played against Gambit because maybe we would have won or something. I don't really think our chances would have been uh, higher. The strange thing about Gambit, okay, is that when we think of them when they were M five as well, people. Like, okay, they were very, very dominant in Europe. But I think some people still don't, like, uh, account just how insanely dominant they were. So, okay, maybe they could have lost, like, in a best of one or something. But in the actual, like, best of three or best of five, like, from, from what I can tell, on, on in offline events, they've only ever lost to European teams three times ever. And it was a different team each time. So you beat them at DreamHack, Summer. Then they lost to um, 
Kersey U at the Tales of the Lane thing where it was like the semi-finals, and now they lost to, Ga to Fnatic in this best of five final of LCS. So they only lost three three series versus European teams like ever, which is pretty ridiculous for like almost a year and a half now. Like, is there some? What is it about their team that means they can have this sort of insane record? Every other team I can think of, even like Korean teams, etc., they have ups and downs, and you know they can't always guarantee a certain placing. Like, what is it about their team that that's unique in that sense? Can you think of anything? It's they're really hard for read for me because I really don't know what their what their thought process as a team is like how they actually practice how they choose their strategies not even not even like in game team communication is it's hard for me to understand how they really uh, perform that like that consistently but um, they do and. Yeah, I don't really know. I can just it, I can basically just attribute it to all of them being really really good players individually and somehow somehow finding the best coordination for them possible to like pull this off. But yeah, I had, don't have a better explanation. Since you had just had this situation, okay, where in season two you had a lot of success, and then in season three, okay, results in LCS at the end, but we overall people would say not doing as well. Okay, so kind of like on the downswing a bit. Uh, there's like a there's an element that I wanted you to talk to because you have like direct experience whereas like a viewer won't, which is that when I look at a lot of esports games, okay, it tends to be that people who do well just for like a, a limited amount of time, what happens is that's when their style fits like you can call it the meta or just what what works at the moment. Okay, their, their style fits it and they sort of ride that to the top and for as long as that's around, they tend to have good success, etc. Then when that drops off. That's when they'll they'll start to drop it unless they're an amazing all time great team and what you tend to see with the, the the best teams ever so someone like a Frost or Gambit these sorts of teams is that somehow they can adapt or they can change the roles of the team or something so that actually they can then be successful in the next one as well so does the fact that Gambit's been able to sort of stay if not the best team in Europe like second best top two the whole time do you have like a, a newfound respect for that after seeing how difficult you've had it in season three changing your styles and trying to find out what works they are definitely very innovative and very flexible in terms of their champions and their strategies like they've they've shown a lot of different things uh diamond um, especially is is like a huge innovator in terms of like he was the one bringing counter jungling into play or like massively at least um and always like scouting new champions that he thought might be viable and actually made viable as well um where everyone just kind of followed him um so that's definitely, I think that's one aspect of why they managed to be that consistent. It's just that they reevaluate the game all the time and like reevaluate their style of play, their, their picks, and um, just make up an opinion about what they think would be best to do at any given point. When, when I look at like having a methodical approach to how you're going to play League of Legends, it seems like a lot of teams like the way I would characterize it is like this, okay, especially a lot of the NA teams or the lesser EU teams, it seems like their focus is almost sort of just on getting like a good rhythm. So they have a lot of practices, okay, we're winning a lot of practice, things seem to be working well, like if we can just carry this form into the game, maybe we'll win. And the problem with that, obviously, is if that breaks down in the game, then like you just lost because you were planning on everything sort of going sort of the way you're thinking it's going to go. But a more methodical approach obviously allows you to sort of map out like, okay, at this exact time we're going to do this and at this exact time we're going to do this. And... I don't know whether it's supposed to be like lore or something, like like people are just exaggerating, but I've heard all these stories, okay, so like Mad Life has all these post-it notes on his monitor apparently with all these timings of this is going to, the cooldown stops here and then this go we go over here at this time and the idea is that he's sort of like memorized every single little detail and you see like in, in team fights they can attack just when the cooldown was ending or something. Is it really the case that some like some of the best players in League of Legends or some of the Asians can really like know every timing and map it out in that way? Like are all the teams trying to do this or are they just really going in a different direction there. What do you think? Um, I don't think it's as magical as you might, <laughs> as you try to make it sound. Um, obviously, you can plan ahead to a certain extent, like even later in the game, team fights, you obviously you can know all the CDs, like all the cooldowns of the spells and um, play accordingly or even make up a plan accordingly. But in the end, we tried it as well to like, like plan out games really really strictly like early game and it's not I feel being or uh, having like a good r situational awareness as a team and playing reactively is almost 
always superior to that because just like a small there just has to be like a small crack in your plan and it's it can be null and void and you basically have to make up a new plan on the fly which chances are you won't be able to do if you like needed a week or so to make up your your first one so i i feel like just playing reactively and having a having a good awareness having good game sense is is the stronger uh, the stronger set to a team because actually when we, when we think of the season two style that you guys had a lot of people, I mean, it's, it seems like the natural way for a lot of people to play games is to be very aggressive, okay, and to be very assertive, and I'll, I'll be the one who makes the play here, because that comes naturally from, like, it's fun to do that if you play, you know, and if you're very skilled, it's obviously fun to just, like, own someone and d dive in there and get them. But at the same time, to play very disciplined and uh, defensively obviously takes a lot of discipline, a lot of, like, a lot of, I say that a lot of, like, intelligence in the sense that you have to be able to react to what the other guy does so you don't know what he's going to do but then you have to be able to re react immediately to it whereas when he's doing the attack he knows what he's going to do and then it's how you're going to defend it etc and so you'd made the point that you actually thought it was stronger to do a defensive style because essentially if you could react perfectly then by like sort of nullifying the guy's attack then he might have like wasted money on like items or something and gold so so you kind of just by nullifying it and going even almost you kind of actually then got a little advantage just off that like, it, does this concept, conceptually, still work in League of Legends beyond just, like, not having the stall-out style itself? Does this still work as a, a good concept? Uh, that depends entirely on the situation. Um, like, the, the champions we have, for example, you might have a very dominant champion on your lane, and um, obviously playing aggressive against that might not be the best choice, and you'd rather, you'd rather want to nullify his, like... Uh, like if you're playing against that, you would rather want to nullify that champion's advantages than really make your own plays. Um, but on the other hand, if you have this aggressive early game champion, then you have to kind of make a move with that as well. Um, it's yeah, as I said, it's it's really situational, and I wouldn't say that generally one the one strategy is superior to the other one. Um, the most important aspect I feel is just being unpredictable. Like, just if you make an, an unpredicted move and you catch somebody off guard, that's often worth more than, than actually like the, the actual uh, gold gain or whatever you get out of it. It's just like his mindset is gonna be, is gonna be influenced. He's gonna be confused, kind of. He's, he's not gonna be in his game anymore. And um, that's kind of, what I think is is the most important part of like choosing your your place so it's just to be unpredictable okay this topic I want to talk about right is about, about frog and playing mid okay but I'm gonna have to set it up in a certain way because I know some people get a bit touchy if someone's considered like the star player in their team the problem is when the team's doing really well the fans are gonna give like all credit to that guy because he's like the one visually is doing all the flashy stuff and getting all the kills and like oh he must have carried him to the win and so it makes a lot of players who are in the team as well who have like more defensive roles or more supportive roles feel a bit insecure like oh I, I had a lot to do with that win you know I did my role over here and so I mean I've seen this in Counter Strike a lot like if someone had the best player over here they'd almost try to make it seem like no we're all we're all equally good like no no one did anything more whereas obviously it's not that people don't have a, a equal input it's that someone's role like if a striker in football obviously scores the goals the defender he can play amazingly but he's not going to score goals the same way so the reason I asked this is I want to know so in season two when people would try and play it up like oh Brogan just carries them every game that's all that happens that's why they win the game that makes people that meant that when in season three when EG's losing. A lot of people then wanted to go the other way and go, oh, now Froggen's off his game now, you know, he's not playing very well. And so you saw this in the all-star votes. Like, Froggen didn't even really come close to winning the actual vote in the end. He was, like, considered the third. And some people wanted to say, like, the fourth best because some people might want to put, like, Bergson or someone ahead of him, you know. Like, was there, in, just in terms of his individual play between season two and season three, had his play as well dropped off with the team not doing as well? Or was he, like, still, like, potentially the best mid in Europe? What do you think? Um, his play overall, like, from before LCS to, to the LCS season may have suffered a little bit, but I don't think even that noticeable, like at least not as noticeable as, as people make, make it out to be. And um, yeah, I think the, the problem that Froggen himself saw as well was that in season two, often it was just about just farming really well in mid. There wasn't, wasn't really a lot of roaming, like you could still farm wolves and wraiths and your mid lane pretty much all game and do really, really well for your team 
um, and that's it still kind of works in season three, but it's more of a situational approach. And he's been really used to to that style of play, just having superior lane control in his lane, um, out farming his opponent, out controlling his opponent, but not necessarily making a lot of plays on the map. And I think that's something he uh, he made out to be a problem in his play and wanted to kind of fix as well. Um, and yeah, he's he's been pretty successful with that as well. Like for example, he's been picking up a lot of Twisted Fate. I think he's a really strong Twisted Fate player at this point. And um, well, the champion obviously naturally makes makes things happen on the map. Uh, but yeah, I think he's gotten too much flag for for uh, his um, his responsiveness of of the situation of our team in this. Uh, LCS season has, um, yeah, overvalued a little bit. Okay, so to actually get you to quantify how you, in your mind, think of the best mids in Europe, okay, so the, the quick way to say it would be in season two when CLG was on top, then people could say, okay, so Froggen's either the best mid in Europe or maybe it's like him and Alex Hitch are tied or something, or just preference people could go on, okay. But since the team's been doing not as well in season three, then they can easily just look to the people who have been doing well. And so the obvious choices, the obvious four people is, so we've got Froggen, but then the other three is Alex Hitch, and his team is always good, so it's easy for people to always say, well, he's like a top one or two person. Then we've got Xpeke, and because of like the backdoor made him famous, and then his team wins LCS, so it's easy to people go, oh, no, I think he's the best mid in Europe, even if they would have never said anything before in season two. And then we've got this fourth guy in the equation now, Bergson, which is because of the storyline of him coming in and his team being so terrible, and then suddenly they're doing amazingly, and people are saying, oh, no, maybe he's like a top two mid or something. They're trying to like boost him up in the rankings. So if you realistically think of like your own experience of these players playing with Froggen and against the others... Like, is it really the case that these other people are like at Froggen's level or above him, or what? Like, where do you rank them in your mind? In my mind, I still think Froggen is the strongest mid lane player in Europe right now. Um, is there a specific reason why? That? The, I I just think he's like from the combination of his mechanical mechanical play and uh, his like his versatility and his lane control is just. I don't know. I think it's just a step ahead, and I have, I hardly see him lose a lane like ever. So it's, yeah, that's my opinion. And then like the other guys are obviously very strong as well. Like nobody denies that. Um, and there's not, it's not like a huge gap or something. It's not like in any given matchup you will always like stomp all over them or something. Uh, the, the differences are not really that, that high anymore in the competitive scene. But. Um, I would say he has a small edge. And then after that, uh, that's pretty hard, a little bit harder for me to judge because I don't play with them as much. Um, yeah, but I, uh, I don't even know if I can, <laughs> if I can be fair in this judgment. I mean, what, what, are the, what are the things like making you go back and forth? It sounds like you're torn between like, I'm not yeah. sure where to go this way. Like, what factors do you consider when you think of it? who's better? Mm -hmm. So one thing is like versatility, um, champion pools, and just general mechanical play. And um, I think in terms of versatility, Xpec is really, really good. Um, he's been playing a lot of champions. Um, then Bjergsen has kind of a style where he often goes for champions that will win him the lane. And which he does as well, and uh, Alex is just yeah. He, he Alex Ish, I think knows very well how to exploit mistakes, and he does that very consistently. Um, he's a rather aggressive player, in my opinion. Um, but he might like. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, but he might on a playing against a really, really good player. He might not be as good as the others. So I have a few bot lanes that I want to talk about, like the, the combos that you've played a lot and they're very, very famous. And so, I mean, we see it in League of Legends all the time. Whenever anyone's really hot or, or the consensus is that they're very good, sometimes it gets pushed even further and they're the best and they're like a million miles ahead of the second place guy. So the first place, obviously, to start when you're talking about AD carries is Wei, Wei Zhao, the, the world elite bottom lane. You've, you've heard now, like, too many people at this point have said, like, oh, he's the best AD carry that, in, in fans' minds, he's elevated to some, like, god status, where it's, like, him, then, like, double lift, then, like, some guys even further below, you know, that's what people think of when they do it. 
Whereas I know that a lot of competitive players, they tend to think that the gaps are quite small between people. So you've played against him in some really big games and his team have been at one point, maybe like IPL5, like the best team. So is it like merited people putting him up here? Have they gone too far? Like you've actually played the guy. So what do you think? I think that people often uh, look at like flashy players or something and value the players that way and just value mechanical skill really, really highly because that's what you effectively see in the match, right? Like if you see somebody 1v2 someone, then uh, then that's really amazing and everyone's going to remember that and going to regard him as a really good AD carry player. Um, so in that sense, I believe mechanical skills are really important for an AD carry, but almost a little bit overvalued <laughs> by, by the audience. Um, but I've played, like the last time I played Rajao on IPL5, um, I don't really remember those matches too well. Um, but when I think about the World Finals, I can definitely say that he was the best AD carry that I've played there, and he was like miles ahead of me. And, In what uh, ways was he the best, though? not just mechanically, I guess you're saying here? Um, I think, I don't know what he does for his team apart from his mechanical play, whether he does any calls or anything, uh, but. The, just this mechanic, mechanic play in itself was just, yeah, was just amazing. So, um, yeah, and by this, at this point, I'm not really sure. Uh, apparently, he was like in quite a slump or something. I, I heard he uh, uh, wasn't really happy with his own play anymore either. But, yeah, there's just the ups and downs that players go through, I guess. And I don't think he will be far away from the top at any given point. So then another one, this is a really obvious one to bring up to you, is the CLG NA mythical double if Chorster bottom lane. And I think this is one where like it's grown in legend more since they haven't played together since than it did when they were actually playing together. And so people have heard too many anecdotes like, oh, they never lost their lane in Korea. Like, they, would, they were 90% to win even in tournaments. You know, they were beating everyone. And yet obviously their team didn't win any major tournaments. They didn't do anything incredible. So have people like, like I asked Krepo this and he sort of said that, People had overrated it in the sense that technically you can be winning your lane if you just sort of force the enemy jungler to come and gank you because like you pushed them back, but you might lose that fight and then lose the game. So technically, yeah, you won your lane, but you also sort of lost the game as well. How much of this, like, were, was there something special that they were able to do as a bottom lane combo that was so incredible? What do you think? I think just had really, really good blind coordination. They know exactly what they were going to go for at any given point, and they just, like, synchronized their play on land really, really well, and that's what made them strong. And um, sure, like, if you play really aggressively, you also expose yourself to ganks or something, and you might end up losing in the way that you give away kills, um, which at the time where we still played them actually was quite a problem for them. But overall, I would still say, like, if they played, I don't know how much support Chosta plays nowadays, Probably not that much, but um, if they came to together the com together as a combo again, I have no doubt that they would be amongst the strongest uh, once more. I mean, since you actually got to live with them for a while and practice them not only in Korea but in America as well, this is the thing that confuses people then, because since CLG didn't do that well after after they split up that bottom lane, it seems to everyone else like you know this this makes the most sense to have this as the bottom lane combo because if it was so incredible, you know why would you give up like potentially the best bottom lane? for anything else. I mean, CLG have their own reasons, like, oh, Chorster can play jungle, or whatever they think it is. But from your perspective, is it kind of weird that you would, like, split up this super-duper bottom lane? Um, yeah, it seems a little bit weird to me. I think the main reason for them was that they just had to shift the roles around accordingly to the players they had. Like, say they have Hotshot, Chorster, and, um, like, you probably wouldn't want to let Hotshot play support. And, um, yeah, they, they basically didn't really have a lot of other choices, I think, just from the, the possible rosters they could get. Um, Aphromoo has been, has like a mixed performance with double lift, um, but overall, I think he at least has the potential to make the same thing happen as Josta. Because, I mean, this kind of leads into talking about the third one I want to talk about, which is the Frost bottom lane. 
Because the interesting thing is, oh, okay, so if we think of the world elite bottom lane, people give all the credit to Wei Zhao, like, oh, he's the god of mechanics, and he's just, and so people are just thinking, oh, what's, Mecha what's Wei Zhao doing? They're not even looking at what the support's doing almost. But then when we move over to the CLG NA one, sure, a lot of people hype Doublelift as this incredible player, but they're also giving credit, like, no, no, Chorster sort of taught him how to play AD carry, and he's telling him all the time what to do, like, don't do that, you idiot, like, that's going to mess it up. So people are kind of now giving a bit more credit to, like, the, the synergy between the two. Well, then when we go to the Frost spot lane, and I'm thinking of the one that had Woong in it, then people go the other way completely, and now it's like, oh, this Woon guy's an idiot. What's he doing? Like, Mad Life's so good. He's like, he's, he, suddenly the support guy's the one doing everything, you know. And so the reason I want to ask about this is I want to know, first of all, like, what, you, what your evaluation of that bot lane was. But then also I wanted to know, so when people think of the bot lane, they're thinking of, like, the AD first, and then the other guy just supports him. So they almost think, like, he's just like his little bodyguard. Like, oh, you just uh, watch my back while I'm doing this over here. But in reality, we're seeing in these, this CLG NA bot lane and the Frost bot lane, in theory, the support could have been having more to do with like, okay, now we do this now, and you, I'm gonna tell you when to do this. So how much of like the, a bot lane actually should work like that? Like how much should the support be having, informing like t coming up with a strategy or telling that? So like, give me these two different perspectives, please. Um, overall, if you look at the game of League of Legends, League of Legends the AD has, to, uh, has more things to focus on basically, like just, the the fact that he has to farm all the time and um, has like a constant concentrate potential the enemy AD um, just has like yeah you know, a natural he just naturally has a lot of things to think about at any given point whereas the support um, obviously has to focus on his lane as well but he has like more room to look around the map or think of some place so I I think like optimally the support would be the one um, calling calling more things than the AD and the AD would be obviously having having an open eye but would be more like the executor of the plan and um, I think that's actually what most uh, teams do as well and um, yeah as for Frost's former bottom lane with Wung and Madlife um, I actually when playing against them it kind of felt that way as well it's just Wung was a somewhat consistent player and he could like execute it some like execute the plays that that the team needed him to do um it wasn't really super amazing or flashy but it was just consistent and just was enough for them and madlev kind of set up um like madlev was the more creative player for sure is there something different when you play against Mad Life? Because obviously he's another one of these players where he's at this god status for everyone. And people are thinking, not only is he the best, but he's like s better than even whoever's second best by such a long shot. Is there, when you play against him, is he really doing things that no one else is doing? Like, is he just be the best, but like similar to the other top guys? What do you think when you're playing against him in the bot lane? I don't think the difference is really that immense as people make it up. be just with the other roles. It's like somebody has a good game and he's getting hyped into heaven and uh, he's suddenly better than everyone else by such a long shot but I really don't think that's that's the way it works and uh, I don't think like Madlife is a really good really really good support player very versatile and uh, plays very aggressively as well uh, makes a lot of plays himself very creative but um, overall I would say he's like miles ahead of everyone else now. In terms of asking about Woong okay so there are not actually many good instances of someone completely switching like a radical position from like top to AD carry where it would like work or anything like, even some of the other more radical swaps. It's very rare that they work at the absolute top level. So they might work at like the, the mid tier level, but you notice that especially in something like the, the situation of how Woon did it going from top to AD in like in theory the, the most competitive scene and he was playing for like the best team in theory. So he's gonna be under incredible scrutiny from like day one of playing this new role. Uh, how do you think he actually like did in terms of just as an AD carry? Like, because a lot of people are going to put it down to if he did well, then it was because he's playing with Madlife and he could make anyone look good. You know, like, what did you actually think of Woom just like evaluating him as a, a, a normal AD? Well, one thing is, no matter how good you play support, you're not going to make anyone look good. Like, oh, it, it, it just you just can't for some like say your AD carry makes a fatal mistake, you can't really make up for everything. And um, so, like, you cannot you cannot really take all credit away from from Wung there. Um, and well, if I think about it, like, if I was to play top right now, I just can't imagine me being on a competitive level like anytime soon. So, 
in that sense, you executed it really well. When you um, had to, so thinking of the, the Wei Zhao bot lane and the, the World Elite bot lane rather, and the CLG NA bot lane, since you, you played the World Elite one in most of the biggest tournaments of your career actually at some point, and then you actually got to experience the CLG bot lane in just like a million scrim sessions and all the rest of it. So you have really good experience like competitive and scrim with both of these bot lanes here. Like your team's actually had a pretty good success against these two bot lanes that's supposed to be really, really good. You beat World Elite a bunch of times and you always nearly seem to beat CLG and A whenever you met them. A lot of people, when they see those, how strong mechanically those ADs are, they're going to think like, oh, if you're the player playing against them, like what could you possibly do? You know, they're going to constantly, you're going to know that they're going to have little advantages or they're going to win the fight here or whatever. What is, the, what is the right approach if you're, in theory, the mechanically weaker AD or you know that your bot lane might be a little bit weaker overall? What kind of uh, approach do you have to have to be able to compete and potentially win over on these incredible bot lanes? Um, there's a couple of things you can do in League of Legends. For example, say you think you have the inferior lane matchup, then you can always swap for a 2v1 lane somewhere, which is mechanically pretty easy to execute and gets you through the early game unharmed most of the time. Um, or you like, or you just have kind of a like you play a defensive support and you just basically don't do anything but farming um, and just don't basically provoke situations in which mechanical skill would even matter. Uh, that's that's something you can you can sometimes do. Um, it's still it's still risky though. Like in in any case, you will you'll be at a disadvantage obviously if you're the mechanically less skilled player. Not only in the early game, but also um, later in the game. It's just naturally that you'll be at a disadvantage. Because a theory I want to run by you, okay, actually comes from uh, games like, like for example, like StarCraft or Quake or something, where a mechanical skill can have a very big influence on winning the game. So you would think, since in, in, in theory, if this guy is so much more mechanically ahead of you, that it should, in theory, be almost impossible to win the game. Because if he does everything perfectly, he's going to win all the fights, etc. But what I've noticed, the trend tends to be okay is that a lot of the best players mechanically, they're so gifted mechanically, they almost don't develop the strategy part of their brain very much because almost everything works. You know, They can do the wrong move and still make it work by like brute force almost. And so you actually see it in the way that they strategically go into the game because a lot of them, they're so, they're so good and being so successful because of their natural gifts that essentially they can just like take situations that aren't so good. And so what tends to happen is the player who knows that he's weaker, at least than that guy, not necessarily weak overall, but he knows I'm going to have a disadvantage when I play this guy. He goes into it with this mindset of, okay, so he's going to have that advantage there. So I have to position myself to only take the situations that I actually have a chance in or are going to be slightly more favorable to me. And the bizarre thing is, because the very skilled guy, he's just sort of thinking, well, I'll just do what I'm going to do and they'll react to it. He's almost sort of opening the door to sort of even the two matchups up when these two approaches meet each other. Because then he's sort of allowing himself to get put in these weird situations where he thinks like, oh, well, I'll still just win this battle anyway, even from a disadvantage. Uh, have you noticed this in League of Legends? Is this like a, at all your mentality when you play the game? Mm, no, in competitive play, I don't notice that a lot, no. It's like players generally have a good enough judgment to not underestimate their opponent. Like say, you know you're, you're mechanically ahead of him, but you, you still see as an, an item advantage or something, you probably wouldn't like push your luck um, but it's something you for example which is interesting with the um, solo queue practice it's a bit risky because the players you meet in solo queue obviously aren't going to be as skilled as the ones you meet in competitive play so if you practice there a lot it can happen that you like adapt a certain mindset where you underestimate opponents a lot because you just allowed to do certain things um, uh, in solo queue which you aren't really allowed in, in competitive play or you're not getting punished for. Because obviously like a thing that, I, that makes me think about that, that same concept of like the idea of the mechanical player essentially not having to be as strategically sound because he can make up for things that he does wrong by being so incredible maybe he just does something amazing and gets out of a bad situation anyway. Uh, since you've played against Doublelift so often in lane I actually heard from, uh, let me think who it was, actually Candy Panda from SK. He said that the reason why he didn't think Doublelift was that impressive, because he actually wasn't that impressed by him as an AD, he said like, yeah, mechanically he's really good. But he thought that because of his mechanics being so good, Doublelift would sort of like 
put himself in bad situations. Like he'd even pick like the wrong champion sometimes because he'd just think like, well, I've decided that's like the best one. So I'm going to win with it regardless, you know. And obviously if you're really, really good, maybe you can do that sometimes. And he would put himself in a situations in team fights where it didn't make, necessarily make sense. Is there anything to this from, from your perspective? Being as like, you've, you know this guy very well in terms of playing lots of scrims against him. Was there anything to that? Um, definitely. Like when we still played them a lot, there was some of those... Uh, some of those incidents where where we had games where he was doing really well on lane and he was getting fed and whatnot, but he was just like repeatedly getting caught out in team fights just by just by like talking about it a little bit and beforehand we could basically shut him down very often, um, and whether that's due to CLGNA's overall strategy of like having him as basically the single threat on their team, or due to him being like overconfident and overstepping his boundaries um, I don't really know but it's it definitely worked out pretty well for us so I think in, in, in a sense yeah but I also think that he's been adapting a lot and he's been thinking more about like how and what he plays than he was back then so um, he's more of a um, yeah he's more he's playing more cal calculated nowadays I would say since you got to, I mean, not only did you play them in the scrims over this whole period of time, but in tournaments you always seemed to get drawn, whether it was in the group stage, or you just always somehow seemed to meet each other, the two CLG teams. And overall, you guys got the better of them, like, in, over the long term, like, by quite a lot, I think, in tournament actual match play. Uh, the strange thing is, their team always came off to the public as very cocky or thinking that they were better than they were. And I actually noticed whenever they would comment on your team, it sounded like they really did think that of the two CLG teams, they were better in some way. I don't know what, what it was based on. And so do you think there was some... Was, when people think of those CLG teams in 2012, the NA ones, they always think of them as one of these teams of like, oh, they could have been better than they were. You know, something went wrong here or every time they had a good tournament, something went... So they're trying to think of it as like projecting that they could have been more. Like realistically, do you think their results in 2012 were like an accurate guide of like how good they actually were? What flaws were we not seeing that the, the team had, you know? Um, well, as Chaucer, well, Chaucer sometimes said, they had like really, really good individual players and I, I, I agree and the potential is definitely there. I would, I would not disagree with that, but I would also say that being able to make use of that potential is like part of being a good team in, in itself. So like if you can't make if you misstep or you can't make use of your potential or um, you just you have a good plan but you don't execute it very well then you can't really put that as, as an excuse and be like oh yeah but really we're this good and uh, we just couldn't do it for this or that reason like it's just in the end it's really the result that matters and um, I think overall their tournament standings in 2012 were pretty accurate compared to like the teams they played against. In terms of actual, it, when you're an AD carry, okay, so the stereotype is that like, you know, we, we protect him early on, then he's gonna carry the game later on if we survive to the late game, and he's gonna be the guy who mechanically, he's gonna win the, the lane, etc. cetera. Uh, when people talk about your mechanics, because if they're comparing you directly to a Wei Zhao or a double lift, they're gonna say, oh, he has bad mechanics. Like, what do you think is a fair evaluation actually of your mechanical level? like? Is it something that's like improved for you over time? Is there just like a certain level that you just, you, that's my level of mechanics? What do you think of the topic? Um, I think it's been fluctuating quite a lot for me actually. I don't really know why, because my practice schedule has been somewhat consistent over the entire time. Um, it's just, I don't know, sometimes, sometimes I have like a really, really good phase and then I have a really, really bad phase. So um, I can definitely see where this, like, this assessment comes from. The, the fact that people, like the, I think the best uh, attribute that people commonly give to me is that I am consistent and uh, I actually don't feel that way at all, like I don't think I'm very consistent, but um, uh, it's... Why do you think people say that then? Um, what do you think they notice in your play that makes them think you're just consistent? Maybe it's just carried over from season two, oh, okay. basically, because... Uh, um, while I wasn't a flashy player whatsoever, we still like won out and obviously partially due to me in that game, pretty much every single game. So it's, um, yeah, that would be like a natural reaction to that, to like think that uh, like, while well, I didn't really make any moves, I would still be like super effective and um, just 
like do my job on the team. Um, so yeah, like I I know that I have a lot of potential even mechanically um, as a player, and it's with every tournament and every tournament game, it's kind of interesting for me to see like what it's gonna be today. <laughs> um, it's it sometimes can be frustrating because you don't be you like oh yeah I practiced this much and I feel really good and then you go into the game and it's just you just fail completely or, or it's the other way around where you actually feel really bad and then the game ends up really well for you it's it's somewhat random I feel and yeah <laughs> one can only hope. Oh okay actually I want to ask you about the gamut bot, bot lane. And so the, the strange thing is, when I look at the Gambit bot lane, like opinions of it, the general consensus view, okay. Early on, people gave a lot of credit to Genja, like, oh, he's a very good AD carry in the early, like early 2012 sort of era. Then people used to like not really rate Edward so highly. And now it seems like it's almost inverted because now people are going, oh yeah, the Thresh King, he's so incredible, Edward. And now people are like not thinking of Genja so good. Like, has their bot lane changed over time to fit this sort of uh, changing of opinions? Like, what do you think of their bot lane through the history of playing them, you know? Mm, I think it's mostly been due to uh, Thresh coming out, mostly, and um, Edward actually playing champions that his impact is more seen on. Like, he, he, can, he makes a lot of plays. That's, that's what sticks in people's mind. If you, if you land a good hook and, like, you, you make a play, you uh, set up a kill for someone that's that will stick in people's mind, not so much if you, I don't know, play Jana and get your hyper carry through laning, like that's that's really good as well, but people are not going to remember that. And um, I think overall their lane mechanic hasn't really changed drastically. Um, Genja is a really, really strong uh, laner, in my opinion. Like he, he has a lot of, I don't know, he just knows how to control the lane really, really well. And um, Edward, um, as well, but he's yeah he's more of like a creative player and of sorts. Like he definitely does best on on champions that make plays. Okay, I actually want to ask you about what like we haven't talked about many actual tournament games here, and so I had a specific tournament in mind that I wanted to talk about because it's a strange one where when we think so think back to season two. Okay, like I said, the stereotype is okay. CLG had this very strategical style like we'll stall every game out we'll we'll play very passive and you know all five players are on board with that and they all know exactly what to do and that's why they're so good and so consistent and this is like the storyline of what people built up in their minds i get the sense so then you go to this mlg event where you don't have crepo so you have to bring in like dre at the last minute and he's going to be the support and then you lose in the upper bracket to dignitas okay so you're in the lower bracket you're late for game one so game one's forfeited and now you're basically one map from just being out of the tournament in something ridiculous like maybe ninth place i can't remember what it would have been something very bad but then your team goes nuts and basically goes all the way through the lower bracket and comes third overall like does this say something about like actually how your team operated that you could just bring in a guy out of nowhere and so you still do really well like and what did you think of that tournament because it's kind of bizarre that you do so badly and then just rampage through the tournament so these two things please it was actually quite a bizarre tournament. That's true because um, the like JV at that time had a somewhat different play style from Crepo. Like he was way attacking way more risks and playing way more aggressively, and we weren't obviously really used to that as a as a team. But it's it's kind of a snowball state of mind where if if you make a move and you get a get an early lead, people are gonna be very. Um, Insecure, sort of. If they if they've been losing out due to the enemy being very aggressive and like outplaying them, then then people uh, get very insecure and uh, just play worse overall. I think I could. I don't remember like every single game we played there, but I remember that I thought our performance was like better than I would have expected it to be at that point um, because we we're coming off a break and whatnot. But um, yeah, that was that was definitely interesting. <laughs> Because one of the things that I think makes it interesting is another easy storyline for people to write about your team is like they'll look, they'll look in 2012 overall and they'll go, okay, so M5 really good throughout the whole year, CLG EU really good and consistent throughout the whole year. What's the one thing these two teams have in common? Okay, they kept the same lineup for the whole time. And you know, teams like SK or Fnatic, they were like switching players, trying someone out, that, that works, that doesn't work. So people want to make it like, oh no, really the strength of CLG is just to keep the same lineup and never change it. But with bringing in this other player, you actually sort of showed that you could bring in a totally different type of player for that position and still make something work. 
Uh, is there really some like special quality to having the same five people? Like, is there like a, a threshold point at which, yeah, it helps this much, but then it doesn't, it, it stops at one point and you can get a new player and it'll still be as good. Like, what do you think of this topic? Cause it's like people have extreme views on it. They either think you should like change a bad player out immediately or maybe stick with it and maybe he comes back around again. What do you think? I think the most important part is your, um, your perspective on your on your team and the way you like communicate with each other and um, I definitely think that roster changes are not something that uh, should be completely um, ignored or like for, for the sake of oh yeah we like we have to stick together because that's always better like a lot of teams have actually profited a lot from roster changes in the past so it's not something that one should always just ignore um, for our team I think it's been one of our strengths that we just held together well as a team, and we could always we could always talk out things. Um, we could we could argue without like hating each other. So that's like a really important aspect, I think. When you went to Korea in two thousand and twelve, since the Koreans are now so strong and their scene is incredibly powerful now, and then we saw like world fans and other tournaments, they were like among the best teams consistently. Uh, people, it's easy for them to think, oh, okay, so I guess CL uh, Korea was ahead of the curve, and then by going to Korea, CLG EU, who like bet, seemed to benefit a lot more than CLG NA, actually like kind of like took some of the secrets or the the upcoming style, and that's how they became a top team. You know, this is like what people might think. Okay, so now you're in a situation where it's been it's ages since you actually went to Korea, and the chances of you going there again are almost none because you're in LCS. Uh, is it really the case that there are certain regions or scenes that in some sense, whatever it's like conceptually or they are in any way ahead of this curve that people talk about? Is every scene coming up with their own stuff? Like what, what's your perspective on it? Um, I think definitely it's been a thing of the past where like in certain regions, things have been discovered like strategies, champions, agent builds, whatever. And then that's been carried over to other regions. And um, Personally, like our time in Korea, I actually don't think like we adopted too much. We, we have we've gone through a lot of changes there. I, I would say we've gone through more changes during LCS or like the, the build up to LCS in season three. Um, and like not having played in Korea for a while, I don't think would be a massive disadvantage. I think the the way the play style works and like, for example, in, in China and Korea, they just have a little bit they valued uh, different champions um, differently. For example, you would they would maybe not value Z as high, which is like a permanent banner pick in Europe or, or Twisted Fate. Well, actually, they do value Twisted Fate, but um, it's and like wh whichever strategy is actually the best can only be found out in direct uh, direct comparison. So yeah, it's. It's really hard to hard to say. Oh, we're not there anymore, and that is the best scene. So um, we're now not adopting their their strategies anymore, or something. They might not even be the best strategies. One doesn't like one can't even really can't even tell. Because in line with this way of thinking that I think a lot of fans have. Okay, so they they just pick the scene that's the best and think they must be doing everything right. You know, you see that. Okay, so it's obvious with like Korea and China at the moment because since people thought to themselves because of IPL5 they thought okay that makes World Elite the best team because they were so dominant there therefore when World Elite goes home to their Chinese league and they play all these other teams well now recently World Elite have actually lost to a few of them and like a couple of them have beaten them so we've got IG and we've got this OMG team so then people start thinking like doing that sort of math where like if this team beats that team then that makes their better than this other team that they also beat which like doesn't really work but they think of that anyway okay so now they're thinking okay oh China has three of the top 10 teams in the world now I think people really imagine if we think of the LCS's that if you took the fourth best team from Korea and the third best team from China and you put them in LCS EU or LCS NA I think a lot of fans really believe that those teams would like win those LCS's is this like a totally ridiculous notion obviously we're speculating here and imagining like what your sense of it is but is this a ridiculous notion is there any truth to it are those scenes really much stronger do you think um, the Chinese LPL somewhat seems to be like for the most part seems to have been a show of like WE and IG and the, the other teams just kind of like going along and playing each other and winning against each other some, once in a while. So um, I do believe their scene is not like it's, it's growing obviously but it's not really uh, on 
on the level of say Korea, which is which at this point has a lot of really strong teams, not just like a few. Um, so if you took those teams and put them into a European or even North American LCS, I don't believe they would just like stomp through everyone now. I mean to give give people a sense of where you and your mind think of things. Like say we took the top the four best Korean teams, would they be in like World Yellow Pete's best ten in the world? Would they have four of the best ten teams in the world? Oh. Mm. <laughs> I wouldn't know what I would base my opinion of, honestly, because these teams, like, there's not a lot of international competition, obviously, so it's, like, when you, when you see OGN, um, you kind of, and, and compare it to, like, the European LCS, as a spectator, it gives you the impression that the level of play is a little bit higher, yeah. um, so, well, an op like, an assumption would be that these these teams would be actually be the the best teams of the world, but until they compare against each other directly, it, it can't really be found out. Like. So does I mean from what you're saying there, are you sort of suggesting then that you think maybe people are overvaluing the level of play there? Like it looks really good, but maybe it wouldn't actually be as effective. Because I mean to give another example, okay, I know that in uh, in Count Strike when I used to follow it a lot, we would have cases where within a certain region or a country teams would be very competitive with each other, like the third best team might be able to beat the best team because of the fact that they all knew each other's styles very, very well, and they, so they kind of knew eventually how to get an upset win over the better team. But if that third best team, even though the, okay, so the best team that they've just upset, if they go to an international tournament, yeah, they're amazing, they're one of the best teams, but if that third best team who actually managed to upset them in their league goes to a league, a big tournament, they might come like 15th because against everyone else who they don't know the style very in depth, they're just going to be another team, you know, they, they've lost the little advantage they had. Is there a degree to which this is part of what's going on in OGN, etc., where it looks super competitive and so we think everyone must be this next level team? Um, I know I do think the, the actual level of play is a little bit higher, but um, it doesn't, that doesn't mean, as you said, that if they, if they play, like if the scenes get mixed between uh, Europe, Europe and Korea and NA, that it would be like a strict dominance of the Korean teams at all because all of the all of the teams would ha basically have to adopt to the specific playstyle the the other regions are performing so and whoever basically does that the best would be, would have the upper hand i think the interesting thing cuz i mean i've seen a million interviews now right where people who have talked about the difference between NA or Europe and Korea and they always put it in positive terms for the Koreans, okay? And a lot of this comes from, like, your team and CLG NA because you went to Korea and you got to see, like, how tough the scene was and things that people hadn't seen yet in international competition. And so it's always billed in terms of, like, oh, the Koreans practice all these hours a day and they're so strict with their practice and they schedule the practice and they, it makes it sound like everything's just better than how they do it. And I think a lot of fans think that, okay, well, in that case, if NA isn't doing very well, then they need to just copy what they're doing over there. But what I noticed was a lot of it's things like, cultural differences like how hard work is valued over there or whether or not you like follow the strict hierarchy of what your boss and the team tells you to do whereas people are a bit more free-spirited in the west so i noticed there was a lot of different things that kind of accounted for some of these differences but no one i've ever heard actually addressed if there's any like weaknesses to korean method or korean teams in general like is there any weakness to their overall approach? Are they really just good in all these extra areas? Or is, do you think there's some area where like people in the West have some natural advantage or something? Um, I, I think that, say it was really that strict, I don't really know how strict their training regimen is, but say it was as strict as people make it out to be, like playing all day and basically not having everything else, anything else, then I do believe that you would have an advantage just by living like a more well-balanced life than than that just for your state of mind like you'd be you'd be happier and consequently you might be might actually perform better in game as well but um i think the the biggest advantage of korea is just that they have this infrastructure for for esports built up for for years now so it, it's been transitioning over into league very very naturally and um it's just a step ahead of, of NA and Europe in that sense that just the infrastructure is there. Players can actually 
uh, focus on the game only and not have to worry about much else. So, yeah, there's have you know they're just making up the better plans for to to bring their their teams to competitive level. When your team wasn't doing so well in LCS, okay. I noticed a few of your players in your team, and even in one of my interviews I did, they tried to put a main part of the reason as to why the team wasn't doing very well down to essentially, this is going to sound like, this is how people portrayed it on Reddit, like, oh, we had to like cook our own food and clean our clothes, and that's why we couldn't like get enough practice and play enough. I mean, when you put it like that, it sounds a bit ridiculous. Like, is that really what was holding you back from winning the tournament? Like, I mean, really, realistically, if the same scenario is set up, so we're going to play season three over again, but it'll... You'll play the same matches, you'll, they'll be just as good, but this time you have a maid and you have a, sh a personal chef. Would you really have been some, the top two team? <laughs> um, I do believe that it actually makes a lot of difference on how many things you have to focus in your life. If, like, it's just, it is really the small things that can just take a lot of your attention away from the game and um, that can consequently make you perform worse, yeah. But it's not like only if we had like a cook and a maid we'd been like the best team or something during LCS now. But I would still as a as a player I would definitely always prefer having everything like taken care of. I think it's just it's just the best environment you can have to like perform at your at your maximum uh, potential. So on this topic, I've actually noticed from doing a lot of interviews and talking to a lot of players over the years in different esports games, it seems like to a fan they think, okay, the player knows like when he's getting really good, like why he's really good and exactly what he's doing. But it actually seems like a lot of the players they don't necessarily know. They just get really good one day and they're like, oh, I'm really good now. This will never go away. You know, then they get really, they have a slump and they're like, oh, I don't know what's going on. And then a lot of them it makes them get a bit like superstitious like they think oh i have to do everything in a certain way that it used to do it when i was doing successfully you know if i do that again it'll make my success come back again and so i get the sense that as a result a lot of them haven't really learned what in real like professional sports they've all learned which is like how you sort of train so that you peak during the moment you have to so your training's really good but you you want, you want your best performance to only come in the official match you know or in like the final of some tournament or something like, how good in general do you think would you evaluate your team at this sort of concept? Like, is it something that you've struggled with? Like, how good do you think you are at it? I don't think we really have too much of an of an idea about it, honestly. Like, it's it's really more like a continual. Like, we just try to practice as much as possible, but we don't have a set plan or something, or um, we don't try to like involve certain certain patterns so we will like perform best at, at, at like a, some tournament or something it's yeah it just to, to like the way it's been for us for example in OGN we had a couple matches where we had members feeling really, really sick before the match like basically throw up and then like go into the best of three and we just won those games super convincingly and we were like uh, okay well I guess that works and it just it's just these kind of things or you practice a lot and then it just doesn't go well for you at all and it just makes it hard to understand what would be what would have been the best thing to do to prepare, prepare for any given match. Because the obvious topic that this leads into is the idea of having a coach. Because really the problem is with having a coach that I see is that in something like an Asian country, because of their infrastructure where they can just afford coaches anyway, etc., and they can have people there. And when you br get brought into a team, it's sort of like you're joining an organization that exists already, it has a coach here and it has a strategy guy here and someone's going to take care of these things for you. And so it's not like you're even really concerned, like, would you like to have a coach? Whereas if you look at the Western teams, okay, so like Americans or Europeans, yeah, I get the sense that a lot of them wouldn't accept a coach because they're thinking of it from the point of view of like, well, if he tells me like, to do this in game, well, I know better than him, you know, like what, he, if he's like a 1400 ELO player, like how could he know better than me what to practice and what to work on? And so they, it's not only that they don't have a coach, they sort of wouldn't accept one, you know, like, cause he'd have to be in, in a way like conceptually, he'd be higher up in the hierarchy, you know? And so the problem that the West is in is that there's no one who can be a coach then because every player who's better than you probably plays for a professional team already and he's not gonna like leave that team and come and coach you, is he? So. The problem is a lot of these Asian coaches who we all think are great, for like Taipei Assassins, etc., who are doing all this scouting and stuff, they're obviously not as good as Taipei Assassins in the game. They're probably not even very good at League of Legends. They just 
of they're doing like simple work of like scouting, making notes, and then the players are making decisions from that information. You know, really, could would your team and would other European teams actually accept like this sort of coaching? Do you think is it something you've ever thought about trying to get? Mm, if it's just about taking work off of the of the players' shoulders, say scouting for a certain matchup, like see what people played, what champions, like something very simple, and then letting the players make the decisions on on the back of that themselves, then I don't think anyone would have a problem with accepting that. It's basically just like uh, getting rid of some, some more work for the players. But um, if you actually have somebody that makes decisions themselves, like or, or tells you to um, play certain strategies or play in a certain way, then you would obviously want that to be someone that you respect or that you think actually has more of an idea about it than you do, because otherwise there's no point. And as you said, there is not really like any ex-professional or whatever players out there that, that could really do or fulfill that role, and that would be respected by, by the teams, because if it was anyone below that level, then the players would just think, well, I either could have thought of this myself, or this is plain wrong, I, have, I, I know more about this than you. So that's really really hard to find that kind of person that, that would really be suitable. Okay, so you, you kind of broke it up into the two scenarios there. So there's the guy who will give you the real in-game advice, which you wouldn't necessarily want if he's worse. And there's the guy who basically is just doing the man hours, okay? He's doing very... Like, it doesn't take a genius to just notice, okay, he always picks this champion and he builds these things, okay? But that information, if you had it, you'd then make your decision anyway, but you'd have more information to make the decision from, you know? So it's it just reducing man hours for you watching replays, etc. But I get the sense that almost no NA or EU teams even have someone like that, even doing simple stuff. Because when I've like even asked some of them, like, why don't you just get someone to just do the simple work? Either they have them and people still have the same attitude they'd have to the other guy. Like, oh, I'm not listening to some 1200 ELO scrub, what he thinks of this team or whatever. Like, even just in terms of getting information. Or a lot of players think, well, I can just watch the VOD myself. Whereas really the point is you can't watch like a million VODs in a day if you're going to play as well. Why don't Western teams have this? I mean, are, are you, do you have someone like this who gets you information? Is it something you're looking for? Um, in the future, yeah. We haven't had this so far, but we're definitely looking into something like that. Um, as for the other teams, I can't really tell. I, I reckon they would have, like at least the higher teams would have, um, if, even if it's only like in-game buddies or whatever, just like doing a, doing a little bit of research for them. But um, yeah, I think it could be really useful. So something to look into. Okay, I, I saw in an interview you made a really interesting statement where you said that it's actually, you said, this is only in April of this year, you actually said that you didn't think it was even necessary for teams to have an AD carry anymore. And I've heard this also from Doublelift, he'd said the same comment. But the difference is when Doublelift says it, people are like, why would one of the best AD carries sort of say that he wasn't like, there's no purpose to having him in the game anymore? Do you just literally mean to necessarily play AD champions at bottom? Because the reason it's a puzzling sentence to me is because some teams who are really good are playing two ADs. They're playing AD champions at mid as well. So what can you break this statement down in terms of the implications of what you meant of it, you know? It really comes down to, to the meta at any given point. The last time I've said this was, for example, when uh, Nasus was still really strong with his wither and like would just completely screw over attack speed based champions. And um, it, it's just, it comes down to what's strong in the game really at any given point. Right now I think you wouldn't, like most most teams still play with an AD carry, um, just because it's like the meta and the way things went anyways and nobody's really going out of their way to like find anything new amazing that is like way off the line, so an AD carry is kind of always there, but I don't even think it's necessarily always needed. What could replace it then? Um, like, what you usually have an AD carry for is just high consistent damage output and like physical damage output in team fights and pushing power. And there's other champions that do the same thing. Um, just, yeah, just different champions. For example, there's a lot of AD assassins who can replace your physical damage and there's a lot of uh, uh, mages with consistent damage output that can kind of replace uh, an, AD carry, an AD carry in that sense. So. Um, yeah, I think one could make it work.
So if we imagine this world where we had this style, would it actually just be the same player who used to be called the AD carry playing that different style of champion? Or would we actually be developing like a new role that we'd have to get different players in for? Um, well, I would, I would reckon you would just play another champion. Like, it's, I said earlier that I don't, wouldn't feel comfortable, for example, switching to, switching to top lane right now. But as a, as a professional player, I think like within, say, a month or so, you should definitely be able to adapt to, to another role uh, on a competitive, competitive level as well. Okay, so for my last question, I always do a hypothetical. And I, I'm always trying nowadays to tailor it to the person. And so the one I thought of for you is like, a, one of, I think one of my most unique scenarios. Okay, so aliens come to Earth. I mean, that, that bit's a bit old at this point. Aliens come to Earth. Yellow Pete isn't in the EG house at the time. So the first thing they do, because they got really fucking bored when they watched that World Elite versus e, uh, CLG match that lasted like four days, they blow up the EG house. They're like, fuck that team. But then they, they notice that you weren't in the house. And so they're like, actually, you know what? That game was boring as fuck, but... They had their charm, you know. There was something about that style in Season 2 that was pretty good. So actually, Yellow Pete's still alive. So we'll bring Yellow Pete in. He's going to be the captain of Team Earth, okay? And you know what? We feel bad about killing all of CLG now. So instead, what we want you to do, Yellow Pete, is when we have this match of our alien superstar lore players versus the Earth, we want to sort of play versus CLG, but oh, we killed them all. So instead, what we need you to do is you're going to be playing AD carry. We need you to pick the players for the other positions where either they would be most similar to the players that we've just killed of EG, or overall they could play sort of the season season two style of EG, the stall out style. Like, who would you pick to go in these other spots? Oh, to play season two style. Um, and replace each teammate of yours, so. Ah, uh, wow, that's, that's hard. Um... God. <laughs> Nobody plays this way. Who could though, do you think? Could you get a sense from a watching more play in that? Maybe they probably maybe they could in that style. Um So just go go down the position. Start with top then. So who would you pick for top, do you think? Um let's see. Darren is dies a little bit too much and is a bit too aggressive. <laughs> um so us could probably make it work. Yeah, maybe I would just take Soas because he's just able to adapt to basically any situation anyways. So he would also be able to pull off that style. Um, then in the jungle... Um, God, it's really hard. With all these Season 3 matches on my mind, like I just, I'm just browsing through the players and just all I see is just like aggressive plays oh, okay. everywhere. Um, so we're looking for a more passive jungle here? Yeah, we're looking for somebody that plays supportive junglers and um, no, no. So who would that be then? The odd one, uh, Cloud Templar. Who are we thinking of? Who, who would be in the range to be able to do that? Mm, yeah, I think actually Cloud Templar wouldn't be too bad of a choice. I think I've seen him play a lot of like more supportive choices like Shen and whatnot, like tanky junglers, so that would fit quite well. Um, in the mid lane, maybe Toys or Rapid Star. I think Toys would be okay. Um, just like. Maybe it's just me remembering them from playing them last year. So like they had like a similar style of farming all day and uh, just controlling lane, but um, they kind of have the same, um, at, at least back then, had the same champion choices as well, like ranged uh, champions that could travel really well. So, and then in the, oh no, we had the jungle, um, support. support. Mm. <laughs> I think I think especially could actually be quite okay. He's uh, he's very calculated player, I think, and he doesn't really um, he doesn't really have like 
this itching under the fingernails to like go aggressive at every every given point. So I think it could work for that. Okay, so do you have a final message or someone you want to thank or say hello to? Um, I want to thank all our fans um, for supporting us throughout the season. And I want to thank everyone that uh, supported me for, or still supporting me for the All-Star match in Shanghai. Um, and yeah, also want to thank our sponsors for making this possible for us. And yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Bitte schön.